really this should be called a toss fry more than a stir fry. Uh, stir fry is a sort of misnomer for it. In a wok, fire, oil, and metal combine in an explosive chemical reaction to create stir fry. When you order it at the restaurant, even at the cheapest hole in the wall place, the meat comes out super tender. Everything has a really nice, savory, intense flavor to it. But is that taste due to extreme temperatures? Perhaps some secret alloy wok? We asked chef and food science writer Kenji Lopez Alt, why does restaurant style stir fry just hit different? Some of it involves the way we're going to treat the meat before we cook it, and then some of it involves the way we transfer heat to the food during the actual cooking process. Let's cook alongside the guy who literally wrote the book on walks and explore the science behind perfect stir fry. The important part of a stir fry, have everything ready before you start cooking. Our experiment needs protein, alkalines, vegetable, aromatics, sauce, thickener, oil, and of course, a very hot wok. I'm using a carbon steel wok. Um, carbon steel is what I recommend people use at home. Carbon steel gets this layer of what's called black oxide when you heat it up. So that's what makes the steel all black. That black oxide not only aids in sort of giving it non-stick properties, but more importantly, it actually transfers flavor to your food. So if you were to cook a stir fry in a carbon steel seasoned wok like this versus a stainless steel wok and feed them to people side by side, the difference in flavor is really immediate and obvious. So I'm gonna start by preheating my wok on the highest heat. The goal here is to get the bottom of the, of the wok really, really ripping hot. Um, there's this expression that a hot wok and cold oil prevents sticking. I tested this a number of times. The temperature of the oil actually doesn't matter that much, but what you do wanna do is add the oil right before adding your food. The idea is that when you get your wok hot enough to the point uh, that you're gonna be properly stir frying, um, that is going to be well beyond the smoke point of an oil, even a sort of neutral, so this is peanut oil, it has a very high smoke point. It's gonna be getting up to around 600 degrees or so, maybe even hotter. That's well beyond the smoke point of peanut oil. So if you leave the oil in there and let it sit for too long before you start cooking, it's gonna start developing these really sort of acrid, burnt flavors. So preheat your wok really well add your oil, and as soon as you add your oil, swirl it around and get your food in there so that the oil doesn't get a chance to burn. Having the right walk technique is key. Let's get a close-up look at the mechanics of those moves. So you might notice that this is called a stir fry, but I'm actually doing relatively little stirring. In fact, some chefs don't even like to use a spatula, they'll just toss like this. So really this should be called a toss fry more than a stir fry. So there's two motions in the walk. There's tilting and then there's translational motion, forward and back. And so what you're doing is the first part, you're tilting the wok forward and it's back towards you. Then while it's still tilted forward, you're pushing it translationally away from you. And then you're tilting it towards you and then pulling it back towards you. And that's the basic motion. And that's how you get the food to kind of blow over itself in a kind of wave. The rotational motion and rapid translational acceleration will cause the food to leap in the air until mostly cooked through, while becoming lightly browned in spots. So the hottest spot of the wok is gonna be this area down here. And you'll see as I'm tossing the food, that's actually where it spends the most amount of time. It heats up on the bottom here through conduction with the metal. And then as you're tossing it through the air, you're really encouraging the evaporation of moisture from it. That's what the whole tossing motion is for. Chinese kitchen burners are 20 times hotter than home burners. So what's the at-home workaround to keep the meat tender and the veggies crisp? So I'm cooking this stuff in approximate half pound batches. That is reasonable for this kind of relatively high output stove. You know, I lived in a New York City apartment for a while that had a really, really crappy stove. And when I cooked there, I found that if I tried to do a half pound at a time, things would end up sort of stewing and simmering instead of properly stir frying. So if you're finding that your food is coming out kind of wet or bubbly, cook in even smaller batches. All right, that broccoli is done. One of the most crucial steps is adding alkalinity to the beef. So let's take a step back and see the chemistry behind the prep. The vast majority of the work you're gonna do in a stir fry comes before you actually put the pan on the heat. The most important parts are getting all of your food into nice uniform pieces. So with meat, you wanna cut it into pieces that go against the grain, that are relatively thin. This will help them cook really fast. So now we're gonna move into washing the meat, which is the part where a lot of home cooks don't do this, but it is essential. So what we're gonna do is put the meat into a bowl and just cover it with cold water like this. And what you wanna do is really get in there and massage it. 
You know, imagine that you're working like a tight muscle that you really want to relax because that's basically exactly what you're doing. You want to squeeze out as much of the sort of red pigment, the myoglobin that's in them as possible because what that's going to do is allow room for marinades and sauces to penetrate so your meat's going to come out more flavorful. And you might think to yourself, oh, I'm just sticking my hand into a bowl of blood. This is not actually blood in here. This is the color of myoglobin. Myoglobin is the pigment inside muscles. I'm used for similar things in the body, oxygen transport and management, but this is not actually blood. Now we're gonna put it in a strainer and we're gonna give it a really good squeeze. Treat it like you're kind of wringing out wet clothes. So the next step in the process is marinating. So I'm adding about a half teaspoon of baking soda per pound of beef. Baking soda, it's alkaline, so it has a relatively high pH. And what happens is it prevents muscle proteins from tightening up overly as they cook, which means that when your beef cooks, it doesn't expel as much moisture, so it stays juicier. Don't be afraid of breaking it up. There's really no way to do this too vigorously. All right, so now that we have the baking soda in there, I'm gonna add the other marinade ingredients. So that's gonna be a half teaspoon of kosher salt, and a half teaspoon of light soy sauce. Now, salt is also important because what it does is it breaks down some of the proteins so that they, again, they don't squeeze as tightly. Soy sauce also contains enzymes called proteases, which actively break down proteins and make them more tender as well. So we're gonna do some shushing wine. This is mainly for flavor. Sesame oil and some sugar as well, again, for flavor. And then finally, a little bit of cornstarch. As we mix it together, and as we marinate this meat, the cornstarch is gonna form a sort of slurry that coats the meat in a very, very sort of loose layer. Um, and what that does is that any moisture that does get expelled from the meat as it's stir frying is gonna basically get caught up in that cornstarch slurry, which is going to bind it. So it's gonna help the meat retain that moisture right next to it so it's juicy as you bite into it. All right, so we're just gonna set this aside. The baking soda, the salt, and the soy sauce, they're gonna to continue to act and they're gonna make the meat more and more tender. So the longer you set it aside, the more tender the meat's gonna come out but you can get away with about 15 minutes or so. Really, the most important thing with the meat is the washing. That's gonna get you like 90% of the way to the tenderness. Now, the broccoli, it's important that you spread it out into a single layer like this so that all the moisture has a chance to evaporate. When you're stir frying, your main goal is to evaporate moisture as fast as possible. The reason for this is that you want your vegetables and your meat and everything to stay bright and crunchy, and moisture is really the enemy of heat. It's a huge energy sink. So the less moisture you have on your food to, the be to begin with, the better it's gonna cook during the stir fry. Evaporating moisture is, is the biggest energy consumption uh, when you're cooking food, whether you're searing a steak, whether you're searing chicken breast, whether you're stir frying. So the drier you get your food to start with, um, the better it's going to sear or the better it's going to stir fry. Let's rewind to the prep and see a key step that will lead to crunchy yet cooked broccoli. I've got this pot of blanching water going. So this is basically just lightly salted water that I've got at a full boil. I like to do this whenever I'm working with green vegetables because it helps them it helps make sure that they cook evenly, first of all, but also gives them a brighter green color. So we get our broccoli in there. We're just gonna let it simmer for less than a minute, basically until you see it turn really bright green. And we're gonna take it right out. Now we're gonna stir fry it. So again, a little bit of oil. As soon as that oil is in there, we swirl it around and we're gonna get half of our broccoli in. All right, let's just get the broccoli out of there. The final element in wok hei is has to do with the way you add the sauce to it. Chinese American food typically has a lot more sauce uh, than stir fries you would find in China. So the flavor profile in here is mainly going to be umami, salty, and sweet. So the umami, that's our sensation of savoriness. It's something that we taste sort of in the back of our mouths. It makes us salivate. The umami in this comes from glutamic acid, which comes when you long ferment sauces. That's the main part of MSG, what makes MSG taste so savory. Um, and the other thing that's going to be in here is inosinic acid, which is something that we get out of fish and shellfish. So the oyster sauce in here is gonna be rich in inosinic acid. That acts basically as a glutamic acid amplifier. So when you have them together, they have this sort of synergistic effect where one of them helps the other and they make each other stronger than either one of them would be separately. So what do you think, Kenji? Can homemade stir fry compete with takeout? It smells really good. It looks really good, I think. I don't know if it's coming across on camera, but it looks great in person. So the secrets here, the really important part was the washing the meat and marinating it with alkaline. And then finally making sure that everything was in uniform sizes, cooking in small batches so that we don't overload our wok and saucing at the very end. So let's see how it is. Yeah, I mean, silky smooth, incredibly tender meat. 
bright green broccoli, a nice savory sweet umami balanced flavor. It's good. <laughs> I'd eat it. 